away, Jack. <laughs> okay, first of all, I want to say thank you to Gail and to everybody on this call. It's a real joy to be participating in this important work with you. Um, the first thing I want to say about myself is that we all know that it's a, it's a sexist thing and a damaging thing to tell a little girl who's good at math that, uh, gee, she's really good at math, dot, 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 for a girl. When I was a little boy, what I used to hear was, gee, Jack, you're really good with babies for a boy. The second thing I want to mention is that I am a counter-feminist. My definition of feminism here is the dominant discourse of feminism. I know there are many definitions of feminism. I'm talking about the one that is most uh, prominent in the media and in politics. Now, I'm a counter-feminist, not an anti-feminist. Um, you can think of the counterpart in, in connection with words of being a counterpart, making a counteroffer, a counterproposal, and counterbalance. Um, Counterfeminists don't say no to feminism. We say yes and. Yes and. So being a counterfeminist is really about pursuing the win-win that has eluded us for so long. We're here to talk about how do we get to gender equality for men, and I think the primary obstacle to gender, equa gender equality for men is exactly the same as the primary obstacle that prevented gender equality for women, which was gender stereotypes, negative gender stereotypes. So what's the worst thing about gender stereotypes is that they marginalize one sex and privilege the other. Now, I believe that the most curious sexism of all is the belief that only one sex is ever sexist and only one sex is ever harmed by sexism. Now, I know that, oh, I wanted to mention in, in terms of the damage of stereotypes, when women were, were partially liberated from the idea that they were weak and ineffectual, Rosie the Riveter became a very um, beloved figure in their lives. It was encouraging. You can do it. You are strong. You are not all of the things you have heard that you are uh, coming from people who didn't want you to be in the same space they were occupying. Now, I know that a lot of people will say that women can't be sexist because you have to have power to have sexism, to, to be sexist. And I get that. And we look across the landscape and what do we see? A very high and mighty and powerful uh, male power structure with the almighty dollar sign at the top. And what we see off to the side is a lowly pink line that we think represents the demeaned status of women. This is where the end comes in. If we take a different point of view, we see something different. We're going to go up in a helicopter and then fly forward. First, we can see that the almighty power structure of men is, you know, it's not really as stable as it looks. In some ways, it's a bit of a facade. It, it makes reference to the, uh, to the idea of the mask that we are encouraged to wear, that we have to wear. And the lowly pink line that we thought women were consigned to really isn't a lowly pink line. <clears throat> In some ways, it's a, it's a very vibrant city. And whereas we had a few men at the top of the male hierarchy, we don't have a top in the female power structure. And we don't have a dollar at the top. There's no top at all. What we have is a heart at the center. Let's take a closer look at this female power structure. Let's zoom in on this figure. 
the large pink circle is a, genogra a genographic uh, symbol for a, a mother. The blue square is a son. The pink, a pink circle is a daughter. Now this is a hierarchy. So whereas the male power structure is a, it's a hierarchy in which very few men really have a lot of power, and most men are at the bottom of the, of the hierarchy with very little power, here what we have is a multitude of hierarchies. We have a network of hierarchies. Um, This is, this requires, suggests, invites us to think about how do we invite men into the female domain, into the female power structure. And it's not going to be easy because what we are going to have to ask women to do is not to share a little bit of power that they have in the male heart. Is, not like what we asked for men, to share the little bit of power they felt they had in the male hierarchy. We have to ask women to share half of their top role in the female power structure. It's a big ask, and the female power structure has a heart at the center of it. There's a lot of love, a lot of beauty, a lot of juice, a lot of wonderfulness in the female power structure. And men are saying, you know, we'd like some of that too. Just like women said, we'd like to have some careers and some economic clout too. This is a big ask for women. And not every woman is enthusiastic about it. Now, I know that most of us think of the women that we are involved with. And we think, well, wait a second. My wife wants me to be as involved as I possibly can be. She, she doesn't want to hold this a domain just for herself. It's important for us to recognize and remember that we're not a perfect sample of what's going on out there. And there are many, many, many women who don't have fabulous careers that they need men to help them achieve, that they need men's support for. There are many, many women out there who just have jobs, just jobs. And there's toil, and there's drudgery, and there's and they don't get a lot of joy and satisfaction out of their jobs. Their joy and satisfaction and happiness and what makes them feel good about their lives is often their position at the top of the female hierarchy. And so I believe there are many women out there, not probably not women we know a lot, but there are many women out there making life very difficult for men at the bottom of the male hierarchy, men that we need to care about. And so a lot of women who have jobs, and only jobs, are hearing men saying they want some work-life balance too, they want to be recognized too for more than just how much money they make. They're sort of saying like, uh-oh, now what? What are we going to do now? These men are calling us on our call for gender equality. What do we do now? Well, okay, I know what we'll do will go to our stereotypes of men. We will marginalize men, and we will privilege ourselves. Now, I think that this is a fair representation of the stereotyping that is at work in the world today. Now, some of these items that you see listed in these word clouds are legitimate issues. However, I think also that the level of criticism we see of men in this word cloud is sort of over the top in some ways. In some ways, it's exaggerated. And it's, and it's very clearly, I think, specifically targeted to marginalizing men who are saying, I'm a good person. I want to be involved with my kids. I want equality in the family. No, no, no. You're violent. You're sexist. You don't have a clue. You're full of toxic masculinity. You know, you're a chauvinist. These are the kinds of problems that I think we need to address and confront. These things are out there. And whether you think these are exaggerated or not, I would ask you to consider what would we call an equal level of scrutiny like this to women? I think we would call it misogyny. 
Look, we want to be on the right side of history. Martin Luther King said that the uh, arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. This has to happen. It's just the next advance in human civilization is that men need to be accepted just as women were accepted for more than what we stereotypically were thought to be. Equality for women was acknowledging women's strength as Rosie the Riveter demonstrated. I want to suggest that it's time now for Rosie the Riveter to meet her counterpart. That's it for me. Thank you.